بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا Dear colleagues we are still handling the sector of head and neck imaging we have finished the anatomy and pathology of the vitreous bone and we have also discussed the anatomy and pathology of the paranasal sinuses and uh, here we are handling an important topic which is an intermediate zone between so many uh, anatomic locations in the head and neck which is known as the baropharyngeal space and um, in order to uh, know the anatomy of the baropharyngeal uh, spaces in you look in the axial images of the CT or MRI and you identify the pharynx and this is the region of the oropharynx and you look uh, on either side of the pharyngeal air column then you see a more or less triangular shaped area which is uh, filled with fat and this is the uh, baropharyngeal space it is intimately related to many of the spaces in the uh, head and neck or in the suprahyoid neck and it is considered as a very important anatomic landmark for evaluation of this particular area the baropharyngeal space contains mainly fat and some of the vessels, arteries, veins, and nerves. These neurovascular uh, structures are not usually seen by CT nor by MRI, but the prominent feature of the baropharyngeal space is the fat, which is hypodense, as you can see in this axial CT image. And also in the coronal image, you can see that the baropharyngeal space is uh, approximately a triangle which is extending from the skull base down to the uh, region of the oropharynx and uh, this is mri t1 weighted images axial and coronal and you know that fat is bright in the t1 weighted images and this is the region of the baropharyngeal space containing fat this is the pharynx and the pharyngeal muscles and this is the parotid gland as you know and we'll discuss this uh, uh, in full details in so many lectures concerning the head and neck image in the coronal plane uh, these uh, stars uh, correspond to the site and the extent of the baropharyngeal space containing fat on either side of the pharynx as you can see actually in order to examine the area of the baropharyngeal spaces you should have the axial and the coronal planes whether by CT or by MRI by CT in the axial image you start from the inferior border of the mandible and you proceed upward until you reach the skull base then in the coronal plane you cover the area of the pharynx from uh, posteriorly uh, the spine and you go anteriorly until you reach the uh, mid part of the maxillary sinus for example the scanning intervals are every five millimeter and we uh, should have axial and coronal scans and in many times we need to inject uh, contra uh, intravenous contrast material what is the value of uh, CT? CT, in my opinion, is uh, good in delineating some of the anatomic details because of the uh, accurate uh, delineation of the bones. This is the ramus of the mandible, as you know, and this is the baropharyngeal space fat, and this is the pharynx. And uh, CT is able to show calcium, and you know that MRI uh, is uh, not good for evaluation or for detection of calcium uh, CT can also show bone erosions and 
bone sclerosis or hyperostosis. But MRI is uh, uh, superior because of the high resolution imaging, because of the multiplanar imaging, because of the delineation of the vascular structures without the need to inject the contrast media, and also MRI in many instances has no bone artifacts, uh, but CT may show sometimes artifacts from dental fillings, for example, and from uh, bony structures as well. And uh, if there is a lesion in the region of the baropharyngeal space, this lesion is usually difficult to be evaluated clinically. The uh, presentations are large and uh, do not point to a specific pathology. And these are some of the symptoms like sore throat, dysphagia, uh, a change in the voice, nasal obstruction, cranial nerve pulses, and you, sometimes you can see a mass bulging posterior to the angle of the mandible like this uh, picture. Then how can you proceed with uh, this area considering the anatomy first? Actually, we can look to the baropharyngeal space or the fat as a box which uh, has four directions, anterior, posterior, medial, and lateral. In every direction, we have a specific anatomic findings. Then, let us start by the anterior uh, aspect of the baropharyngeal fat. This is the fat and this is what is present in the anterior aspect to the fat. Actually you can see the pterygoid blades and you can see the ramus of the mandible. And you know that the pterygoid muscles, the medial and lateral pterygoid muscles are attached to the lateral pterygoid blade. Also you can see the attachment of the temporalis muscle to the inner part of the mandible. And outside the ramus of the mandible, you can see the masseter muscle. And uh, this fat is very important, which is the fat behind the anteral wall. This area is, uh, it belongs to the infratemporal fossa. And in case of neoblasts, the surgeon wants to know if this fat has been infiltrated or not by the tumor. This is an important finding. Then you can see the muscles of mastication which are the masseter, the temporalis, and the pterygoid muscles, medial and lateral pterygoid, the mandibular ramus, and the mandibular nerve branches are not seen by CT nor by MRI, and also you can see fat behind the anteral wall which is, as I have said, an important anatomic landmark. Then you came to the parotid space. And this is the ramus of the mandible and uh, the blue arrow points to the styloid process. The styloid process divides the space between the ramus of the mandible and the cervical spine into two compartments. This compartment is known as the stylomandibular tunnel and this compartment is known as retro styloid space. Then the stylomandibular tunnel is the space between the ramus of the mandible and the styloid process. It contains mainly the deep lobe of the parotid gland. This is the superficial lobe and uh, the superficial lobe of the parotid and this is the deep lobe. The superficial lobe and this is the deep lobe. And you can appreciate the intimate relation between the parapharyngeal fat and the deep lobe of the parotid gland. Then, a vascular structure which is very important this vein is known as the retromandibular vein it is located actually near this particular area then the facial nerve you cannot see it lymph nodes are not seen unless they are enlarged then only you can see the deep lobe of the parotid gland the external carotid artery may, may be also seen near to this area the retromandibular vein is a constant structure. The facial nerve cannot be seen. Lymph nodes are not seen unless they are enlarged. And this is the styloid process. 
posterior to the styloid or between the styloid and the cervical spine, this is known as the carotid canal or the retrostyloid space or post-styloid space. And the, the carotid canal or these names uh, contain the following anatomy. Number one, the internal carotid artery, the internal jugular vein, the cranial nerves from the 9th to 12th, as well as the sympathetic plexus and the group of lymph nodes. And you remember that the nerves are not usually seen. Lymph nodes are not seen unless they are enlarged. But you should remember that these are the contents because the pathology will arise from these contents, as we will see. Then we came to the medial aspect. And the medial aspect is known as the pharyngeal mucosal space, which is formed by the pharyngeal mucosa and a membrane which is known as the pharyngeal basilar fascia. The pharyngeal basilar fascia. This is a tough membrane that protects the area of the parapharyngeal space as well as the deep soft tissues from any infection or uh, uh, lesions coming from the pharynx to extend deep but this membrane is not that tight it can be crossed by aggressive lesions whether infection or neoplasms then we finish with the anatomy and we came to the pathology uh, the same will be followed we start space by space and they know that the uh, uh, this is the parapharyngeal space fat and this is the anterior aspect this is the posterior aspect the lateral aspect and the medial aspect on the medial aspect you can see the pharyngeal mucosal space and uh, any lesion arising from this area will push the parapharyngeal fat laterally and uh, most of the lesions arising from the pharyngeal wall medial to the parapharyngeal fat are carcinomas. 98% of the masses are carcinomas. 80% of these 98% represent the squamous cell type of carcinomas. Other types of carcinomas, they are considered relatively uncommon include adenoid cystic and mucoepidermoid carcinomas. The, the remaining 2% include other tumors rather than carcinomas like lymphoma, sarcoma, angiofibroma, blasmacytoma, and melanoma. Then, if you look to the parapharyngeal, uh, to, the, uh, to the pharynx or the medial, uh, the mucosal space, there is a difference between the nasal and the, the oropharynx. Both are seen on the medial aspect of the baropharyngeal fat. On the nasopharynx, you see a very important anatomic structure, which is known as the torus tuberis. And this torus tuberis is made of two muscles, which are seen best by MRI, separated by a very small fat blade. This is the torus tuberis. And these are the two muscles, the tensor and the levator veli palatine muscles. You may remember the name and you may not. These are the two muscles forming the torus tuberis with a fat plane in between. Then this torus tuberis is separating two well-defined fossae, the ostician tube fossa and the fossa of Rosimola. Then, if you look carefully here, and you see a mass, there is an enhancing soft tissue mass here, which is located medial to the parapharyngeal fat. Then you know that this mass is carcinoma. Then locate to the site of the carcinoma, whether it is in the nasopharynx or in the oropharynx, according to the anatomic details, as we have mentioned. Then what are the symptoms of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Look at this image. You see a very big mass heterogeneously enhancing along the medial aspect of the baropharyngeal fat extending into various directions. I will mention these directions in a moment. Then uh, 
This is the presentation, the clinical trial, asymptomatic mass in the neck due to metastatic lymphadenopathy. And this is one of the common presentations. The tumor itself is, is not symptomatizing, but the metastatic nodes will appear as masses in the neck. Also, the presence of the lesion intimately related to the ostician tube will result in obstruction of the tube and the development of otitis media. And this is very important. Otitis media in adults or elderly patients should be considered uh, uh, very much looking for any nasopharyngeal malignancies. And maybe bloody nasal discharge due to bleeding from the tumor. Then, uh, this is a good example of a nasopharyngeal carcinoma with epsilateral otitis media. And you can see in the axial image, there is a mass infiltrating the nasopharyngeal wall, medial to the baropharyngeal fat. And uh, in the uh, bone window image, you can see that the middle ear cavity is obliterated by secretions. And also, you can see the mastoid air cells are obliterated by similar secretion secondary to obstruction of the ostician tube. Then this is a nasopharyngeal carcinoma on the right side, mass medial to the baropharyngeal fat. When you consider carcinoma, you are now in the nasopharynx because of the torus tuberis and the, the uh, ostician tube and the fossa of Rosenmuller. The lower section shows two big lymph nodes. This is one, and this is another one, and there is a third one here. This is the stenomastoid muscle, and the, the upper deep and lower deep cervical lymph nodes are located below or uh, underneath the stenomastoid muscle. And uh, the, the tumor is on the right side, and the nodes are also on the right side of the tumor. By MRI, you can see a lesion infiltrating the nasopharynx of intermediate signal in the T1 and the heterogeneous high signal in the T2-weighted image. And you can appreciate uh, easily the presence of secretions in the mastoid secondary to involvement of the ostician tube. Then, nasopharyngeal carcinoma can be uh, detected more earlier by MRI because of the MR sensitivity for the anatomy. You remember that the torus tuberis is formed of two muscles, which are the tensor and the levator veli palatine muscles. These muscles are separated by a high signal fat because this is a T1 weighted image. The earliest sign of nasopharyngeal carcinoma by MRI is obliteration of this fat plane, meaning that there is a mass infiltrating the torus tuberis and obliterating this fat plane between the two muscles. But if the mass is large, you can appreciate the presence of the tumor. There is a big lesion infiltrating the right side of the nasopharynx, crossing the midline. It is on the medial aspect of the baropharyngeal fat and the, the lesion showed low signal in the T1, high signal in the T2 and a strong homogeneous post-contrast enhancement and this is nasopharyngeal carcinoma. And this is the staging of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. It is an easy uh, staging procedure. In cases of T1, the tumor is confined to the nasopharynx in T2, the tumor is extending to the oropharynx or into the nose. T3, invasion of the bones or the baronasal sinuses. T4, intracranial or intraorbital extension. Then, if you see a mass in the region of the nasopharynx, then you say that this is most likely a nasopharyngeal carcinoma. And you start to describe the tumor. You say that there is a big, ill-defined soft tissue mass infiltrating mainly the right side of the nasopharynx and encroaching on the uh, baropharyngeal space. The mass is extending into different directions. We say effacement of the fossa of Rosenmuller and the dovstachian tube, which is 
uh, an evident feature. Then, anteriorly, the tumor will extend like this. It will extend into the posterior nares, may invade also the nose. And uh, anteriorly, uh, you can see the pterygoid blades. It has destroyed the medial pterygoid blade as well as the apex of the maxillary antrum. Extension into in, in between the pterygoids, this is the pterygoid fossa, and the pterygoid fossa has been invaded. But this is not tumor, it is just sinusitis. The tumor is enhancing, as you can see here. Then the tumor may extend into the nose, into the maxillary sinus, as well as into the infratemporal fossa if this fat has been obliterated. Posteriorly, the tumor will invade the prevertebral muscles and it may also erode the bone and extend inside the spinal canal. And here you remember the carotid cheese. The tumor may involve the carotid cheese encasing the vessels. Then, laterally, the tumor, whenever it extends laterally, it will encroach on the parapharyngeal fat and also it will obliterate the fat totally maybe and may invade the muscles of mastication the pterygoids the temporalis and the masseter as well as the remus of the mandible medially the tumor will cross the midline to the opposite side it may affect the opposite parapharyngeal fat it may infiltrate the muscles of mastication on the opposite side then inferiorly and superiorly are seen in the coronal and sagittal images the inferior extension of the lesion will reach will extend towards the oropharynx and the tongue while the superior extension of the lesion will invade the skull base and may go inside the cranium then other nasopharyngeal malignancies as i have said the, the carcinomas, adenoid cystic carcinoma, and the mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Also, you may have other tumors like lymphoma, rhabdomyosarcoma. All these tumors are in relation to or compared to the squamous cell carcinoma are considered relatively uncommon. And how can you uh, predict the possibility of lymphoma or rhabdomyosarcoma, for example? And you predict this by the age of the patient in most of the cases. And you know lymphoma and rhabdomyosarcomas are usually seen in the pediatric age. And this is a big mass in the nasopharynx on the right side, infiltrating the infratemporal fossa and the muscles of mastication. This mass is seen in a female patient 16 years old. Actually, this is not a, 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 an age uh, which is, is uh, not suitable for uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Nasopharyngeal carcinoma can occur in this age, but I, I prefer to consider uh, lymphoma more better than uh, carcinoma, especially in uh, children and adolescents. But you see a mass here. The, this mass is big, obliterating the nasopharynx, and is encroaching on the parapharyngeal fat bilaterally, it has extended into the nasal fossa on both sides. It has destroyed the pterygoid blades more on the right side and is associated with bulky lymph nodes. And you know that bulky lymphadenopathy of homogeneous texture with no areas of breakdown or calcification may point to the diagnosis of lymphoma rather than carcinoma. You know, metastatic lymphadenopathy from carcinomas are usually necrotic and contain areas of central uh, breakdown. Then you see the creeping nature of the, of the mass, the bilaterality of the lesion, the homogeneous density and the enhancement, and this was in esophageal non-hodgical lymphoma. Another case of non-hodgical lymphoma in a patient 19 years old with a mass infiltrating the left side of the nasopharynx, the left nasal fossa, the maxillary sinus, the infratemporal fossa. The mass has extended intracranially in the paracellular area as well as inside the sphenoid sinus. 
lower down it reached the soft palate and the, the axial image shows bulky lymph nodes this is the submandibular salivary gland and this is a node and this is another one third one fourth one then you got bulky homogeneously enhanced lymph nodes together with the mass in a relatively younger patient then you consider the possibility of lymphoma rhabdomyosarcoma is considered the most common sarcoma of the head and the neck it arises from the primitive mesenchymal cells and most of the lesions are seen around the age of 12 years it can occur in the orbit in the nasopharynx in the temporal bone as well as in the baronasal sinuses and if you look to this a child six years old and you see a big mass infiltrating the wall of the pharynx encroaching on the baropharyngeal fat and then the mass is medial and anterior to the baropharyngeal fat there is uh, erosion and the destruction of the alveolar margin there is also uh, erosion and the destruction of the mandibular ramus maybe invasion of the parotid gland and of course invasion of the pterygoid muscles as well as the wall of the pharynx and this is a rhabdomyosarcoma. Another case of rhabdomyosarcoma in a female patient, 10 years old. You see, this is a very big mass infiltrating the pharynx on the right side. And it has also invaded the parotid gland. And you can see that there is a fat anterior to the, uh, to, to the mass. Then you know that this lesion uh, is arising from the wall of the of the pharynx particularly the nasopharynx then the patient is young and you are in the differential diagnosis between lymphoma and the rhabdomyosarcoma as you have seen before that lymphomas are usually associated with bulky metastatic lymphadenopathy but the rhabdomyosarcoma usually spread by bloodstream it gives hematogenous metastasis and are, is not usually associated with regional lymphadenopathy then you may prefer the diagnosis of rhabdomyosarcoma in a child based on the absence of significant lymphadenopathy in the neck this uh, rhabdomyosarcoma presents by pain and uh, cranial nerve pulses there is a mass with bone destruction as you can see here this is t1 and this is t2 there is a big mass on the uh, lateral aspect of the baropharyngeal fat and then this space will be discussed later but you see that this is the wall of the pharynx and this is the fat and the mass is arising from here from the pterygoid muscles this is the normal side and it has invaded the mandible it has invaded the masseter and also the parotid gland then uh, some of the benign lesions occur in the nasopharynx like this cyst which is known as torn walled cyst it is a mucus retention cyst in the midline of the nasopharynx uh, this cyst has a typical location and a typical appearance it will show fluid signal, low signal in the T1, high signal in the T2. and may show bright signal in the T1 if the contents are proteinaceous. But its location and the appearance is almost typical. And this is an example of a torn walled cyst which shows some increased signal in the T1 due to the proteinaceous contents and the bright signal in the T2 is a characteristic site of the lesion. Also, adenoids, which is the uh, prominent of the nasopharyngeal tonsils, will encroach on the nasopharynx, as uh, seen in this plain X-ray. You see the nasopharyngeal air column is attenuated by this soft tissue mass in the posterior wall of the pharynx. Uh, usually, you do not need further evaluation apart from the plain x-ray but uh, this is an example of adenoids by mri t2 weighted image also nasopharyngeal angiofibroma is a benign lesion 
which is partly seen in the nasopharynx and partly seen in the nose. This tumor arises near the sphenopalatine foramen, and this foramen is located exactly here at the apex of the uh, maxillary sinus between the sinus and the pterygoid blades. This is the initial site for the nasopharyngeal angiofibrom. The mass will grow inside the nose and also inside the nasopharynx. And very, very commonly, the mass uh, can grow through this area, which is known as the pterygobalatine fossa. This is the normal side. This is the pterygobalatine fossa and extend into the infratemporal fossa. You remember, this area is the infratemporal fossa. And in this particular case, between the pterygoid blades, you can see enhancing tumor tissue, denoting involvement of the pterygoid fossa as well. Then the nasal fossa, the nasopharynx, the pterygoid fossa, the pterygobalatine fossa, and the infratemporal fossa. This lesion is very vascular, and it usually presents by epistaxis. And if you have an angiogram, which is commonly performed to do some embolization before surgery, you will see hypervascularity of the tumor. This tumor is characteristically confined to boys in the age of around 20 years of, of age. And this tumor is hypervascular. As I have said, it's supplied mainly by the ascending pharyngeal and the ascending palatine branches of the internal maxillary artery. Then if you inject the contrast, the tumor will enhance significantly. If you have MRI, you will see multiple dilated tortuous signal void vessels going through the tumor. And this is an example with a mass in the nasal fossa and in the nasopharynx. You see, this is the pterygobalatine fossa which has been involved by the tumor because the tumor originally arises in this particular area which is the region of the sphenobalatine frame. This is a good example of nasopharyngeal angiofibroma of a male uh, 15 years old presenting by epistaxis. You see a strongly enhancing lesion within the nose and the nasopharynx and the bone window image showed that there is bone remodeling denoting that this tumor is not aggressive this is a benign lesion and in the coronal image you can see one of the particular or peculiar features of this tumor which is extension into the sphenoid sinus very commonly the nasopharyngeal angiofibroma extends into the pterygobalatine fossa and also extends into the sphenoid sinus Another example, and you see a mass in the nose and the nasopharynx with an epicenter near the sphenopalatine foramen. And in the coronal image, you can see the mass filling in the nasal fossa, eroding through the floor of the sphenoid sinus with bulging of the tumor inside the sinus. Then we're still on the medial aspect of the baropharyngeal fat and going lower down to look at the oropharynx. Then the oropharynx has no anatomic features. It is formed or uh, surrounded by the pharyngeal constrictor muscles, which separate the air column from the baropharyngeal fat. Then one of the important uh, structures in the oropharynx is the tonsils. And uh, commonly you can see tonsillitis. And this is just an example. The, this is the tonsils in the T1-weighted image and in the T2-weighted image. They are enlarged. They are uh, uh, of bright signal in the T2. They are inflamed. Then if you inject the contrast in cases of tonsillitis, you can see a streaky enhancement within the affected tonsil. But this is a different issue. You remember, any mass arising medial to the baropharyngeal fat should be considered as carcinoma whether it is present in the oropharynx or in the nasopharynx. And this is an oropharyngeal carcinoma, almost obliterating the oropharyngeal air column on the medial aspect of the baropharyngeal fat on the left side and is also encroaching on the opposite baropharyngeal fat. This is also an oropharyngeal cancer 
and it is related to the medial aspect of the parapharyngeal fat on the left side. The tumor is encroaching on the uh, pharyngeal air column. It is also extending superiorly into the nasopharynx. And this is a common feature of, of oropharyngeal carcinoma. It can extend upward, and also the nasopharyngeal carcinoma can extend downward. Uh, an oropharyngeal cancer, a mass, big mass in the oropharynx, uh, on the medial aspect of the parapharyngeal fat, the mass is uh, hypervascular by angiography, and it shows heterogeneous contrast enhancement. This is carcinoma. Then, uh, in uh, this area, you, you look. Uh, this is the uh, MRI T2 weighted image, and this is the CT scan at a lower level of the same case. Here you see the tumor, which is uh, located on the wall of the oropharynx, and this is oropharyngeal carcinoma. Then in the neck, you see a big lymph node, which is heterogeneously enhancing, representing metastatic lymphadenopathy. But uh, this is the submandibular salivary gland on the left side, and this is the submandibular salivary gland on the right side. They are not nodes. This is the metastatic node. Also, lymphoma can occur in the oropharynx. The same, in the, you remember this case of non-Hodgkin lymphoma of the nasopharynx, which has extended a little bit inferiorly to encroach on the oropharynx as well. And you remember the bulky, homogeneously enhanced lymphadenopathy. And if you look on the opposite side, you can see also some lymph nodes. This is a lymph node, and this is another one. But this is the submandibular salivary gland, and this is the right submandibular salivary gland. Tonsils can be the seat of carcinoma as well. Any mass arising medial to the parapharyngeal fat from the wall of the pharynx should be considered as carcinoma until proved otherwise. And this is a mass in the region of the uh, tonsil along the lateral wall of the oropharynx. The mass is extending downward, reaching the level of the epiglots here. And this is the arabiglottic fault. It will be discussed in full details in the lecture of the laryngeal imaging. And here the tumor is also invading the mouse floor, as you can see here. But in the neck, you can see this necrotic lymph node deep to the sternomastoid muscle. And this is another one, metastatic lymphadenopathy. And this is the third non-necrotic lymph node as well. This is a good example of tonsillar carcinoma. You remember that most of the carcinomas occurring medial to the parapharyngeal fat are of the squamous cell type. You see a mass in the region of the tonsil, the lateral wall of the oropharynx, encroaching on the parapharyngeal fat. The mass is medial to the fat, then consider carcinoma. And here you can see that the right tonsil is enlarged. It is homogeneously enhanced. And, uh, and if you look uh, to the parapharyngeal fat, you see the lesion is medial to the parapharyngeal fat. Then you consider it as tonsillar carcinoma. And you may say that this is oropharyngeal cancer. There is no big difference. And, uh, here you can see a mass in the region of the lateral wall of the oropharynx, and the mass is homogeneously enhanced. And if you look in the rest of the neck, and you can see lymph nodes that are homogeneously enhanced. This is the submandibular salivary gland, lymph node, lymph node, lymph node, lymph node, lymph node. Then in the presence of bulky, homogeneously enhanced, these nodes are not that bulky, but you may consider the possibility of lymphoma, and this was a non hodgkin lymphoma. This is also a non hodgkin lymphoma of both tonsils being more on the right side associated with metastatic or lymphomatous involvement of this uh, node uh, uh, posterior to the barotid gland. Then we have finished with the medial uh, aspect lesions arising along the medial aspect of the parapharyngeal fat and we came to the lateral aspect and on the lateral aspect 
the uh, you remember the stylomastoid uh, the stylomandibular tunnel where the deep lobe of the parotid gland is located and uh, most of the lesions occurring in this area lateral to the parapharyngeal fat they will displace the fat medially they are arising from the deep lobe of the parotid gland and these lesions may be benign but more common they are on the malignant side and this is the pleomorphic adenoma of the deep lobe of the parotid gland on the left side encroaching on the baropharyngeal fat from its lateral aspect. I will discuss the uh, salivary gland imaging in a separate lecture in full details. And this is an example of a mass arising from the deep lobe of the parotid gland on the left side encroaching on the baropharyngeal fat from its lateral aspect and this has been proved to be a denied cystic carcinoma of the parotid gland. Then, in this uh, MRI, T1 and T2 weighted image, this is the parotid gland and the, the deep lobe is involved by a big mass which is displacing the baropharyngeal fat as well as the pharynx more to the right side. And the lesion showed intermediate signal in the T1 and the high signal in the T2 and this in, uh, in, uh, in the literature is considered a sign of benign lesion. If the water content is high within the lesion, you consider it as towards the benign side. This is not a solid rule, but it can help. Then this is the rest of the parotid gland that the deep lobe of the, of the parotid gland is involved and this has been proved to be a pleomorphic adenoma of the deep lobe of the parotid gland. Then we came to the anterolateral aspect and uh, this anterolateral aspect comprises the mandibular ramus and the, the pterygoid muscles as well as the maxillary sinus. Actually, the masses in this particular area do not need the help of the parapharyngeal fat to locate the site of the lesion because they are, in most of the cases, extremely evident. Like this case which is of a classic mandibular osteosarcoma showing the sun ray speculations and the mass is very big, it arises from the mandible. You don't need to look to the parapharyngeal fat which is compressed from the antro lateral aspect. Also, this patient had a bronchogenic carcinoma metastasizing to the ramus of the mandible. There is a big mass and the mass is also infiltrating the pterygoid and the masseter muscle, destroying the mandibular ramus encroaching on the baropharyngeal fat. And this a child, you can see a heterogeneously enhanced mass infiltrating the pterygoid muscles. And you remember in the pediatric age group, you consider the possibility of lymphoma or rhabdomyosarcoma. If you see bulky lymph nodes in the neck or significant lymphadenopathy, you may prefer the diagnosis of lymphoma and in the biopsy will solve the problem in most of the cases. Then we came to the posterior aspect or the posterolateral aspect, which is known as the bostostyloid space where the carotid canal is present. And you should remember the anatomic structures because they will give rise to the pathology. The internal carotid artery, the internal jugular vein, the cranial nerves, and the lymph nodes. Then there are three main lesions arising in this particular area. They will displace the fat anteriorly and may displace the, the styloid process also anteriorly. These are the glomus tumors, the lymphadenopathy, and the neurofibromas from the uh, previously mentioned cranial nerves. And this is a good example of Ishwanoma from the uh, retrostyloid space. This is the styloid process, and if you compare it to, to the opposite side, then you can see that it has been displaced anteriorly. The mass is located posterior to the styloid, posterior to the fat, and it is considered one of three, either to be a lymph node, or to be a glomus tumor, or to be a, a neurofibroma or schwannoma. You know that a big lymph node like this one should be associated with other lymphadenopathy, and the glomus tumors are usually very strongly enhancing. 
Then he, he, the, the remaining uh, possibility is schwannoma, and this was a schwannoma. One may ask about the displacement of the styloid process. Is it uh, malleable so that it can be displaced easily? You know that a tumor uh, of benign nature growing very slowly in this particular area, it will displace the styloid process gradually until it is pushed like this. Then, if you look here and you see the styloid process is displaced a little bit anteriorly by this soft tissue mass posterior to the parapharyngeal fat. And the lower section showed that the rest of the mass is cystic. And you remember that uh, schwannomas are more common to be cystic than neurofibromas. And this is a schwannoma in the retrostyloid space. The emboragangliomas or the uh, uh, glomus tumors or chemodectomas are, are common lesions in the head and neck. And there are many locations for them. I will discuss this in the uh, infrahyoid neck lecture, but uh, you should know that there are four common sites for chemodectomas, the carotid body, between the bifurcation of the uh, internal uh, common carotid artery, the jugular foramen, the glomus jugular, or inside the, the middle ear, which is the glomus tympanicum, and along the vagus nerve, and this is known as glomus vagi. Uh, this will represent about uh, 0.5 or 0.6% of the head and neck neoplasms, and most of the lesions are in the side of the glomus jugular and the carotid body tumors. They are slowly growing hypervascular lesions. And if you have an angiogram, you can see extensive vascularity. Also in the CT, you see a prominent enhancement. And the glomus tumors are seen in the head and neck at the four common sites, as I have mentioned. And in the region of the baropharyngeal fat, you can see that the tumor is arising posterior to the fat. The fat is obliterated here and also posterior to the styloid process, which is usually displaced anteriorly. Then, in order to discriminate between the glomus vagal and the carotid body tumor, there is a simple way. Glomus vagal will displace the internal and the external carotid arteries anteriorly, but the carotid body tumor will be located between the bifurcation of the end of the common carotid artery. And this is a classic appearance of glomus vagal tumor displacing the uh, uh, internal and external carotid arteries anteriorly. If you look here, the tumor is present posterior to the styloid process, posterior to the baropharyngeal fat with prominent enhancement. On MRI, you can see this feature, which is known as the salt and paper sign. The salt will represent the tumor matrix, and the paper will represent the signal void vessels within the tumor matrix. This is very highly vascular tumor. And uh, this is T1 weighted image, and this is T2 weighted image. You can see the bright signal and uh, the signal void vessels within the lesion. Uh, glomus jugular is centered to the jugular fossa, and uh, this tumor will destroy the jugular fossa, and the related part of the vitreous bone may invade the middle ear cavity and may extend in the cerebellopontine angle area as well. Uh, these tumors are on the benign side. They are very, they are slowly growing, but some of the tumors may give metastatic deposits into the lung, lymph nodes, in the liver, or in the bone. Then uh, CT is good in delineation of bone erosions. As you can see here, there is erosive changes in the jugular fossa. And this jugular fossa is occupied by an intermediate signal mass, which is strongly enhancing after uh, injection of gadolinium. Then the differential diagnosis of uh, lymphadenopathies in the cervical area or in this area in particular will depend on the clinical picture and the imaging finding. 
if the clinical picture says that there is a non-primary malignancy, then the, the, the nodes will, will have metastatic pulse. If the patient is known to have lymphoma, then consider lymphoma. If the patient is known to have sarcoid, then consider nodes secondary to sarcoid. Then, if imaging show a primary lesion in the nasopharynx, in the oropharynx, consider metastasis. If imaging shows bulky, homogeneously enhanced nodes without areas of breakdown or calcium, consider lymphoma. If imaging shows nodal calcification, consider infection, particularly TB. And necrotic nodes can be due to inflammatory lesions and can also be secondary to metastatic deposits. If there is no clinical or imaging finding to support one of these diagnoses, then you just say that I see cervical lymphadenopathy and I recommend lymph node biopsy. This is an example, almost typical example of nodes secondary to lymphoma. And you see extensive uh, lymph nodes that are bulky, homogeneously enhanced, no areas of breakdown and no calcification. And here you can see extensive nodes in the, in the neck, in the, in the submental area, and in the uh, deep cervical region, in the, around the, the submandibular salivary glands. I will discuss the anatomy and the pathology of lymph nodes in a separate issue. Do you remember this uh, case of non hodgkin lymphoma infiltrating the nasal and the oropharynx and uh, associated with lymphomatous nodes in the neck. Then uh, metastatic nodes are usually secondary to head and neck malignancies, particularly nasopharyngeal carcinoma. In about 75% of cases, oropharyngeal cancer in about 20% of cases, and thyroid cancer in about 5% of cases. The nodes are usually necrotic, and they contain areas of breakdown. And this is a case of melanoma. You can see this nodal metastasis with necrotic center. If you know the primary, it is easy to diagnose that this is a metastatic node. In conclusion, we have a space filled with fat known as the parapharyngeal space. It is used as an anatomic landmark for lesions arising in this particular area. If the lesions are seen along the anterolateral aspect of the parapharyngeal fat, consider tumors or lesions from the maxilla or from the mandibular ramus or from the pterygoid or the muscles of mastication. If the lesion is from the lateral aspect or posterolateral aspect of the parapharyngeal fat, consider the deep lobe of the parotid gland with benign and malignant lesion. If the lesion is posterior to the fat, displacing the fat anteriorly, consider the three common lesions here, which are the glomus tumors, lymphadenopathy, and the neurofibrome. If the lesion is medial to the parapharyngeal fat, you remember that carcinomas are very common. 98% of the lesions arising medial to the parapharyngeal fat are on the carcinoma side, either this pharyngeal cancer or pharyngeal cancer or tonsillar carcinoma. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Thank you very much.